Hi, this is Ryan Crodel at Bail & Sell again. Thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here today. Uh, this will be a recap of CES 2018, at least a, a small portion of uh, what we saw at 2018. Obviously, we could spend hours and hours talking about everything that that goes on there, um, but uh, we'll talk about things that are most relevant to the uh, consumer wearables and digital health space, and then touch on a few other areas of interest as well. And um, a few housekeeping items before we get going. Um, I, I like to keep these as interactive as possible, so please do uh, submit questions through the webinar interface as they come up, and I'll try to, to address those as we go through here. We've also got time set aside at the end for, uh, for Q&A as well, but please do submit those through uh, the, the webinar interface, and uh, we'll take those as, as they come up. If you want me to uh, clarify or dive deeper on anything as we, as we go through the, the presentation here. I've got about a half hour worth of content and then depending on the amount of, of questions and areas we want to cover further, happy to do so um, uh, for the remainder of the hour if, um, uh, if there's enough content and questions. So um, uh, one of the questions we always get is, uh, will, will the slides be made available? And the answer is, of course, yes. We'll um, share the slides and also a recording of the webinar if any of your colleagues or anyone else you think might be interested in the content couldn't make it today, uh, we, you, can, uh, we, you can share those. Uh, usually within a day or two, we'll have that, um, that recording done and uh, the slides out to you so you can share those with uh, whoever you like. And um, with that, I will uh, we'll get going here. Just um, don't forget to ask questions through the webinar interface as we move along here. So um, a few, uh, we'll go through a few key takeaways from what is uh, still the, the largest technology show, conference, convention, whatever you want to call it in the world. Um, and uh, some of the key themes there that are relevant around digital health, wearables, virtual reality, and some other areas of interest. In, um, uh, in the space that, that Valencell occupies in, in the consumer wearable space, in the health and medical space, and in other areas like um, enterprise and industrial, sports and fitness, those, those types of uh, areas where uh, our technology is relevant and our, our customers are uh, active on a daily basis. So, um, now, with that said, there is uh, the Consumer Electronics Show is a massive, uh, massive conference that takes over uh, nearly all of the Las Vegas Strip, um, all of the Las Vegas Convention Center, all of the Sands Expo and Convention Center area, as well as many of the uh, hotels and suites along the along the Strip, where uh, companies, if they don't have a, a space uh, on the, the show floor, often rent out suites and remove all the furniture and turn those into uh, demo areas and uh, areas to display their technology. So certainly can't cover it all, uh, and definitely not in a half hour, but, um, but we will cover some of, the, some of the more interesting things we saw. Along with uh, uh, the, the last numbers I saw were about 180,000 of our uh, close friends and colleagues in the consumer electronics area. It's interesting. It is um, it's, uh, very much a reflection of how technology is embedded in nearly every part of our lives today. It wasn't that long ago that, that CES was primarily – uh, focused on um, uh, devices in the home, so TVs, mobile phones, appliances, those kinds of things, and those are all still very much present here. But um, as you'll see as we go through the the, um, the presentation here, there's there are a bunch of different new technologies and new aspects to how technology is pervasive in our lives today, and it's all reflected here in this uh, in this giant convention, which is in some ways uh, very exciting, and we'll talk about a lot of those uh, cool and exciting things 
and in other ways is completely exhausting at the same time, uh, all in all in one week. So um, we'll start going through a few of uh, a few of the key areas we talked about here, and um, and let me know if you have questions as we go along. So the first one is is uh, voice assistance. Uh, we saw the beginnings of this last year with. Uh, Amazon's Alexa being fairly omnipresent across uh, a variety of different segments of the show and in uh, a variety of different devices. And that uh, really escalated in a big way uh, this year, uh, particularly when uh, Google decided to really uh, be everywhere in and around uh, the, the CES convention. I'm sure if you've seen any of the, the coverage of the, uh, the event. This was um, a big part of uh, what a lot of people saw. They were, uh, as you can see, uh, covering the monorail. They had two huge uh, buildings outside of the Las Vegas Convention Center. They were all over the, the strip, uh, visual billboards, uh, really everywhere. You, um, you might imagine uh, you could be or could place an advertisement. Google bought uh, advertising space there. And, and um, uh, in some ways, this was a response to, to Amazon's presence there last year, but also is, uh, it, it recognizes the, the fact that many of these companies, particularly Google, Amazon, Apple, um, Microsoft, Samsung, others, uh, see voice interaction as um, as the future of how we are going to interact with technology in many ways. Now, it's it's debatable as to how exactly that plays out, but I would love to know how much Google spent just on this CES and just uh, maintaining the presence they did here, because it. Uh, if I had to guess, it would be multiple tens of millions of dollars just for. Uh, just for this, let alone all the investments on, they're making on the product and integration side of things. So, um, uh, very much reflective of the uh, of the investments being made here. But it's certainly not just Google. Um, Amazon was uh, was everywhere as well. Uh, Apple's HomeKit, uh, even Samsung's. I think they call it uh, Bixby, and uh, LG has something similar. But it was really uh, the, the voice assistants across the board were embedded into really everything across the show. And, and when I say everything, I mean literally everything from speakers and smart displays to TVs to appliances to mobile phones to wearable devices and hearable devices that we'll talk more about later. Um, light switches, light bulbs. Uh, one of my uh, well, I can't even call it really the favorite. One of the things I thought was most interesting, Kohler, the company that um, makes faucets and toilets and other things, has now uh, has now embedded a voice assistant into a toilet and also into a shower head. Um, so uh, you can now talk to both of those things as you uh, go about uh, using those appliances, which I, I was I still haven't been able to get a, a good answer to uh, how exactly this is all going to work. If every appliance and every device in your home or, or whatever room you happen to be in has the ability to listen uh, and, and act on commands, then how do you know which one uh, you want to talk to and want to actually do something? Whereas uh, you don't necessarily want the other ones to listen or act on anything you're doing. So there's there's a, a lot of things to work out here, and in and, and many ways, this is starting to get to the the peak of the hype cycle, if you will, with uh, with voice assistance. And I'm sure you'll see that come down a bit uh, over the next few years as the um, realistic use cases start to play out in where it makes sense to use voice and where it doesn't. Uh, but right now, uh, the, the default assumption is from a lot of these companies, uh, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with this, but it, uh, uh, the default assumption from a lot of these companies is just put voice into everything and we'll work out the, the actual user experience and, um, and use cases later. But um, just 
make it have the ability to listen and uh, we'll figure out how to coordinate all of that uh, down the road. So um, that you can expect to see more of that, but then also I, I think you can see, expect to see a lot of shakeout with um, where voice makes sense and where it doesn't. Do you necessarily need to talk to your shower head to tell it to make the water colder or warmer? I'm, I'm not seeing that as a, as a real uh, significant need, but um, again, it's, it is, um, it's part of the hype cycle at the moment and just where we are in that, uh, in that stage of things. Um, but with that said, it's uh, the, with the, the types of, and the amounts of resources that Google and Amazon and Apple and others are, are putting towards this effort, you can, uh, you can expect to see a lot more of this, uh, at least in the near future. So um, next we'll move on to the, the digital health and, and medical side of things. And I, I guess the, the, the best way to describe this is that the, and this is something we've talked about for several years now, is this convergence going on between consumer wearables and medical devices. And that was certainly on display, uh, in full display at CES. You can see this um, headline from U.S. News and World Report uh, really, I think, hit the nail on the head as, as far as this topic goes and that, that line between wearable technology and true medical devices and, and healthcare devices has, is continuing to blur. You, you continue to see um, in uh, announcements from, uh, from all of the major wearables players on the consumer side of things with uh, Apple and Fitbit and Garmin all now describing themselves as more, um, uh, the, and these devices as more uh, health-oriented devices as opposed to sports and fitness trackers. And on the other side of things, the, the medical device companies are uh, recognizing that uh, consumers and, and, and patients are generating a lot more data relevant to their uh, health and medical conditions outside of medical facilities and so are, um, are, are very interested in uh, building devices that, um, that continue to collect data at uh, medical grade accuracy but then feed that data back into electronic health record or patient treatment protocol of, of some kind. It's, um, and there's, this is playing out in, in a variety of different ways, um, which uh, on, the, on the medical side of things, you're seeing it, um, you're seeing it play out in, in particular with, uh, with devices and use cases targeted towards specific conditions, specific diseases, um, uh, specific disease states that that can be um, uh, can have a very targeted solution to to meeting very specific needs for those particular disease states. Um, not surprisingly, sleep and on the other side, on the consumer side of things, sleep and stress were or, uh, were and and uh, are continuing to be big topics. There was actually an entire area dedicated to sleep technology. And that included everything from beds to sleep masks to neurostimulators that uh, that help you um, get into better dream states and a variety of other uh, sleep-related technology and stress management-related technology that um, that seems to be hot topics these days. And um, I think you'll see continue to see more and more of that as there's. There's more awareness, more recognition of how uh, sleep quality impacts our, our overall health and wellness. And uh, one, one interesting observation we had was also that related to this topic of this convergence between consumer wearables and medical devices is we saw probably more than uh, more so than any year in the past, we had uh, a significant amount of, of uh, conversations and traffic in our booth from uh, traditional medical device companies, pharma companies, health and wellness companies, all looking at the, the latest technology on the consumer side of things, where you certainly didn't see that in years past with uh, companies like uh, Medtronic and Siemens and J&J &J 
you didn't see um, many of those companies represented, whether it, with a booth or or in uh, attendees at the at the show, uh, but wanting to have very real discussions about very real projects that are in the works at those companies to um, build health and medical wearable devices that people wear outside of a medical facility. And um, I, for this, uh, the next um, bit of, uh, to drill down a little bit in terms of what exactly that's starting to look like, I mentioned um, there's uh, how this is playing out is looking at very specific conditions and disease states. And I, I, we, and this slide, by the way, is borrowed from uh, a presentation that uh, one of the co-founders of Valence Cell, Dr. Stephen LaBeouf, presented at, uh, at CES this year. And um, we like to refer to this as, in terms of the, the wearable and, and medical solutions and use cases, are still very much in the, the forming stages, and, um, uh, but we're starting to see moves uh, and time and realistic time frames for real public health impact. And there's really uh, kind of four high level categories that this is breaking down into. One is around user interface. And this is going on today. You're seeing um, more and more announcements along these lines where, uh, where the wearable devices are used as a new user interface, a new screen to present data from existing health and medical devices. And some examples of this, you saw not necessarily at CES, but a few months ago, um, both Apple and Fitbit, and I believe some other wearables companies as well, announced uh, partnerships with Dexcom and, and other um, glucose monitoring companies to, um, to integrate those devices. And it's, it caused a little bit of confusion in the market because uh, some people thought you could now monitor your glucose with your Fitbit device, and that's not actually the case. What's going on is the Fitbit is now integrated with, in this case, a Dexcom continuous glucose monitor to present the data that otherwise would be on the, the screen or the app from Dexcom, present that data on a Fitbit or an Apple Watch in this case. And those are, those are going on now, and that's, that's nice to be able to uh, to make it easier to view the data and make it more present and more uh, visible and easier to use for, uh, for the, the people who are also wearing uh, continuous glucose monitors, just one less device uh, or one less screen they have to check. Um, so those are, all, um, uh, those are all happening now. I would say the uh, overall public health impact is relatively minor there. And you can kind of think of this as uh, from left to right as uh, low to high um, impact on overall public health. The next one being health screening. So using the sensors, now that, now that these, particularly the biometric sensors in these wearable devices have, um, have gotten to a level of accuracy where you can start to see granular levels of detail in identifying and screening for chronic health conditions, things like asthma and COPD, uh, diabetes, um, uh, migraines, those types of, uh, of uh, health conditions. And you're starting to see some announcements from companies like Cardiogram and even Apple, I think, is doing something separate uh, in screening for atrial fibrillation. And it is important to, to understand that is, that is after the fact screening of identifying when an atrial fib uh, uh, incident did occur at some point in the past. We're not talking in this particular category, we're not talking about real-time uh, monitoring and diagnosis of atrial fib. This is um, post-processing of data coming off of these wearable devices that then can identify um, uh, a condition or an incident like, uh, like AFib. And in this case, there, there are, there's huge potential for um, saving money across the public health system in terms of early diagnoses and prevention of, of potentially serious issues down the road. Uh, so there, there are some very real and, and potentially very significant public health impacts there. Um, this, this third category is, is more around replacing a, a, an existing medical device. So um, you can think of this like a um, connected blood pressure cuff or a 
um, a halter monitor for someone who has had um, a heart condition of some kind or, or um, uh, a, a, a heart issue or perhaps a, a minor heart attack. Um, these are wearables that are uh, worn outside of medical facilities, but um, make those devices uh, um, either more wearable, more convenient, or increase the amount of compliance, i.e., how many times people take their blood pressure in, in a given day, as an example, for uh, being able to take blood pressure readings from a mobile phone. Um, so there's, uh, in terms of the overall impact, there's certainly potential in terms of saving money on lower cost equipment. Again, uh, building all of this into a single device as opposed to multiple devices increases compliance, uh, uh, ideally would lower the number of hospital visits, particularly emergent care hospital visits uh, as people go along. But the idea of these wearable devices will increasingly start replacing um, existing medical devices that are already um, already cleared and proven, um, it, it cleared in terms of uh, regulatory hurdles and, and proven in the marketplace. And then there are other, um, this last category of entirely new medical solutions that have not been possible to date with the combination of uh, an existing uh, treatment plan or device along with a, um, a new device, um, in most cases a wearable device of some kind, to do things like um, uh, predicting the onset of an asthma or COPD attack, as an example, or a migraine or a cardiac event of some kind. Take the asthma COPD example where um, uh, someone who's managing that condition already has a um, has an inhaler with medication that helps uh, helps address the onset of those attacks, but if those could be uh, predicted with enough time to uh, that someone could uh, take evasive action of some kind, that would present an entirely new medical solution that wasn't possible in the past and address a, a completely unmet need and, uh, and has very real potential to substantially lower the individual or the impact on individual patients as well as uh, as well as uh, broader uh, public health costs across the entire system so um, those are just some uh, more specific examples of how this is how this whole convergence is playing out and you saw uh, several of these different uh, applications or examples showcased uh, at CES this year um, in, in case you didn't see, one of the, um, the CES has numerous tracks based on um, specific topics, and the Digital Health Summit at CES this year was uh, one of the largest and continues to be one of the fastest growing areas of, of CES. And um, uh, three of their top um, uh, subject matters and, um, and presentations or, or panels that, that went on at, at CES were related to one to the, around digital therapeutics and uh, what some people are calling software as drugs that um, uh, in this case would fall into this, um, that last category of entirely new medical solutions that have not been possible to date. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk, I'll give you an example of, of one of those uh, as we go along here. Um, second one, or, um, uh, the, a big topic of discussion was around brain health, particularly with um, the uh, Alzheimer's conditions and, and really crisis going on uh, around the world, as well as issues around uh, depression, addiction, other neurological conditions that um, can, uh, can be treated with some form of technology, whether that, that be entirely software-based or a combination of um, uh, software, hardware, and of course, um, uh, intervention from uh, from health and medical professionals. There's a variety of different things going on in that area to to quantify brain health and then apply existing uh, existing treatment protocols and and adjust those treatment protocols in a way that haven't been possible uh, to date uh, without being able to, to, to quantify that those uh, the, the level of severity of those conditions at any given time. 
And then the last one, we've talked uh, quite a bit. I won't spend much more time on this on clinical grade wearables, um, but also uh, think about how that applies in a telemedicine approach where um, someone might ha not have to drive 30 miles or an hour, hour and a half to get to a medical facility if they can be treated with a, a high resolution wearable device that provides clinical grade information that's fed back into their medical record and their healthcare provider can, can see all of that data uh, and interact with the patient over uh, a telemedicine portal. It, uh, it really opens up uh, entirely new possibilities for where healthcare, where and how healthcare is actually delivered. Uh, and again, with potentially significant impacts on uh, the, uh, the health and medical system as a whole. So um, with that, I'll move into the next one. Let me check and see real quick. Um, oh, uh, don't see any questions here as we're going along. So if you do have any questions, please do submit those through, uh, through the interface here. Uh, there was one question about what is the start time for the webinar. I'm assuming you um, know that's already started. So we'll move on uh, to uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. And um, I guess the best way to describe this uh, is uh, both of these areas are uh, beginning to mature. And um, it, the, the CNET quote here of the, the evolving uh, right under our nose, these don't get quite as much attention these days as things like machine learning and AI and those types of, of uh, technology buzzwords. But what you're starting to see is uh, very real use cases, very real applications of VR and AR across a wide variety of industries and use cases. So um, a few of the examples here, uh, in this one, it, this happens to be a, um, a, a, uh, a what do they call it? A workout? A, 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 oh no, I'm sorry. A gym in a in a VR headset, and so it is a combination of, as you can see, a um, uh, a uh, gym equipment along with a VR headset that allows people to uh, have the experience of working out in a full gym, but um, in uh, very much a virtual experience. We also saw quite a bit of of uh, AR in particular with augmented reality applications in um, enterprise and industrial applications, whether that's in uh, training scenarios or in uh, repair and construction scenarios. Uh, there were um, a, significant, uh, a significant amount of use cases displayed at CES around uh, enterprise and industrial as it relates to AR and VR. And then there's also um, uh, quite a bit of, of overlap in um, in AR and VR and the, the previous uh, trend I just talked about earlier in terms of digital health and medical, some of which um, I, I mentioned training earlier. You saw several applications of using VR and AR for um, surgical training and then also augmenting the, the surgical experience uh, or the, the surgical interaction uh, for physicians and, and uh, other uh, nurses and anesthetists and so forth who are also involved in that uh, in the surgical process to be able to pull up information, identify very quickly um, uh, different aspects of the, the patient record or the, the surgical procedure that are going on at any given time. Another good example of, of VR in that space is, and this uh, we demoed at our booth, at, at a, um, in the valence cell booth at CES, um, a partner of ours called First Hand Technology is, is using VR treatments for uh, pain management in healthcare facilities. So this is uh, pain management uh, uh, across the board or across the spectrum from uh, burn victims to um, just uh, chronic back pain and, and everything in between, surgical, surgical recovery, all kinds of uh, aspects along those lines. And it is a, it's literally taking people's mind off the, off the pain in, uh, that their body is experiencing. And they, they're seeing some really remarkable results of 50 to 60% pain reduction in patients while they have the, the VR headset on. And that's uh, for a frame of reference, 50 to 60% pain reduction 
is on par with uh, pharmaceuticals and opioids' ability to uh, diminish pain. So we're, we're talking about a completely pharmaceutical and drug-free way to reduce pain at those same levels that, uh, that people are experiencing with, with opioids today. And obviously, given the opioid crisis in this country and in other places, there's, um, there is um, uh, significant potential health impacts and, and public health impacts to, to this type of technology. And if you can imagine today, this company is just using this in uh, healthcare and medical facilities, but it, you can see a, a fairly clear path to uh, allowing someone to take home a, a VR headset and have this same exact experience at home whenever they have a, a flare-up of pain or um, need to uh, need to reduce their pain in some way, they could put the headset on at home and, and use it there without having to um, resort to pharmaceuticals or opioids or uh, go into a, a healthcare facility to to uh, to get help and it, it introduces this concept of a of a VR pharmacy if you will to, to carry over that example where um, they're looking at different um, different visualization experiences and how those impact different sources of pain in um, and, and how that's applied to to different patients who are who are dealing with different sources of pain so you may have a different visualization experience with uh, if you are dealing with uh, a burn or if you're a burn victim, or it may be a different visualization for someone who is recovering from back surgery, or maybe a different uh, experience for someone who is dealing with a broken leg or whatever it might be. The idea that you could go into a quote unquote VR pharmacy and pick out the, the visual, the virtualization experience that um, that is most appropriate for the pain you're dealing with is, uh, is a really interesting concept. So um, that was one, uh, just one example of, of um, this, uh, an application of VR technology, in this case VR, but similar experiences for AR as well, um, where uh, it, the, the use cases and the, the applications of this technology are starting to address very real problems uh, in the world. So, um, Moving on, I don't see any questions about that either at this point, so I'll move on to um, uh, the area and the, the, the trend around hearables. And it was certainly um, uh, one of the, the biggest, on the, the consumer electronics side of things and in the wearable space, if you will, this was uh, one of the biggest um, takeaways from CES is uh, the this hearable space, so these uh, computers in your ears, if you will, being able to do things beyond, far beyond just um, listening to music. So, one of the one of the bigger trends, of course, is and there, it kind of breaks down into three categories around hearables. One is the this notion of of what we're calling true wireless. So, there the the two earbuds themselves, like the ones you see over here on the left, or the one in this gentleman's hand here. Um, not connected at all by wires. Each bud, each earbud fits in either ear, and the earbuds communicate with themselves wirelessly and communicate with a device of some kind wirelessly to either stream music or present biometric data or sports and workout data. Or, and this is kind of this leads into the second major trend around hearables is this notion of augmented hearing. So. Um, New Hera, which is this company here, these um, earbuds um, uh, that you see here on the, the red stand, the, they are very much um, addressing this, this uh, opportunity around augmented hearing where, um, especially now that at least in the U.S., uh, um, uh, over-the-counter hearing aids can, um, can be useful for, um, uh, for, it can now be purchased in your local drugstore or pharmacy or uh, grocery store. And this, uh, these devices allow the augmentation of hearing uh, and specifically um, turning up certain sounds or certain, certain voices uh, within um, a, a noisy room, as an example, and, and blocking out other ambient noises that are, that are just causing interference. And, um, the uh, so uh, new here is a, a great example of that, but there are others uh, doing uh, similar things, 
and you're you're also starting to see this this notion of, of augmented hearing and in, in trying to address uh, hearing issues before they become a severe problem and before someone may need a, a full-blown hearing aid. Now, with that said, you're also seeing the hearing aid companies, like the, the one you see up here. I forget which company this, uh, this is, but all of the major uh, hearing aid companies were uh, present at CES with Boothspace and or um, uh, sweet space in the um, uh, in and around the show floor, and they're all looking at um, adding new uh, augmented hearing capabilities that would be applicable to someone who may not necessarily today be using uh, using a hearing aid. Part of which includes integrating things like biometrics for um, uh, for new and different use cases. Kind of getting back to the the, the earlier table I presented. Uh, doing new and different things with, with hearing aids that have not been possible before, things like measuring heart rate and measuring blood pressure and those types of applications for, um, that, that are relevant for, uh, for that user base. Um, and then last but certainly not least, of course, is I talked earlier about voice assistance. Vo the, the hearables are a natural extension of voice assistance, particularly um, uh, as it relates to uh, many of the examples I showed earlier where, where voice assistants are being embedded, um, the ability to take that voice assistant with you anywhere you go is, um, is a very compelling um, idea. And the kind of, if anyone's ever seen that movie, Her, uh, the, that, that is becoming more and more of a reality of this always on connection to um, uh, a uh, voice assistant and voice uh, interactive service that really puts uh, all kinds of information and capabilities at the, the tip of our tongue. And one of the one of the significant factors here, of course, is that as of today, most of this voice assistant technology has been designed for something that ha is plugged into a wall, whether that's a, a voice assistant speaker or some of the appliances <laughs> I showed you earlier. Um, the uh, power management has not been a significant concern around the voice assistance. As soon as you put that into a hearable device that, that has to deal with extremely limited uh, real estate and extremely small uh, battery sizes, the, the, the power draw of always being on and always listening is, is, a, um, is a significant challenge right now for integrating voice assistants that are always on into these hearable devices. And so that's why you saw uh, several big announcements from companies like Qualcomm, companies like Ambic and others who made big announcements around low power solutions specifically designed for wearable and hearable devices uh, to be able to add voice assistant capabilities that are always on. Right now, most of, most of the um, hearable devices with uh, with voice assistance integrated have a user experience that's very similar to what this gentleman is doing on the bottom right here, which is um, uh, which is push a button on the earbud and that engages the voice assistant. It's not constantly listening to you where you could just out of the blue say, uh, "Hey Google" or Alexa or whatever it might be. But that's changing rapidly, so uh, the, the power is still very much a, a concern along those lines. So those are the, some of the major things we saw related to hearables, but um, we also continue to see just a, a tremendous amount of activity and growth on the hearable side in general, as um, uh, really every, every major consumer electronics company and, and almost every major wearables company out there is either already has a hearable product in the market or uh, you'll see one coming soon uh, later this year or into, into 2019. Um, I look at the questions here before I jump off to the next topic. Uh, uh, someone was asking what's the name of the device on the bottom left? I'm assuming you uh, are asking about this device I actually don't know the name of that device. I'm gonna to have to get back to you, off the top of my head at least, I'm gonna to have to get back to you on that. I believe it is a Samsung product, but I'm not 100% sure on that, so don't, don't quote me on that. But let me, um, let me 
uh, uh, let me get back to you on that. So um, sorry about that. I should know, uh, but I uh, don't know off the top of my head. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll certainly get back to you on that. But thanks for the question. Um, so uh, there are, of course, a lot of other things going on at CES, most of which I can't cover, but I will touch on a few here. Uh, the upper left here, I, I almost labeled this automotive, but that's really not even, uh, that, that's uh, almost too limiting at this point. But um, suffice it to say, uh, CES has become, or a large portion of CES has become a major automotive show. And um, so you, every one of the major OEMs, uh, automotive OEMs is uh, has a presence there as well as uh, all of the the tier one automotive suppliers, if not the tier two and tier three suppliers as well. The big themes obviously are around um, uh, electric vehicles and also in autonomous vehicles. Uh, but uh, even automotive doesn't really capture it because there's uh, there there was a bunch of different um, uh, displays and information about things like scooters and 18-wheelers uh, and other, uh, uh, other um, transportation and vehicles really across the spectrum in, uh, in and around the, the um, transportation industry. So it's, uh, I even saw uh, an electric pod looking thing that uh, was called a vehicle, but it looked just more like a, a futuristic pod specifically for just intra-neighborhood uh, transportation, uh, I, I guess, between <laughs> between different sections of uh, individual neighborhoods, but not meant to be out on uh, a major thoroughfares. So it, uh, it really, it's it's a it's become a massive part of of CES. This the whole area around transportation, smart home. I've touched on quite a bit, but you saw numerous appliances, not just with the voice assistants that I talked about before, but adding touch screens and integration with other devices. So when, for example, you pull something out of the refrigerator, it can, it'll automatically add it to a shopping list or um, uh, there's a variety of different use cases along those lines in the smart home, as well as, of course, with integration with lighting systems and security systems and you name it, it. There's there's a big big battle going on to to be the the hub of the the smart home, and that's still very much to be determined. Uh, mobile devices, of course, are are still very much uh, a presence at CES, although less so now that Mobile World Congress here coming up in just a few weeks uh, over in Barcelona is is uh, become or has become such a such a major event in the mobile world. But you see things out like uh, like the flexible screens you see here. Uh, you saw quite a bit of the more the the advanced prototypes at at CES that uh, that showcase what what some of these companies are working on. And then of course TVs and and screens in general um, are, are still a major part of CES and, um, and and take up a significant portion of the of the floor space. This one I thought was kind of cool from. Uh, what Samsung calls the wall, which is, in this case, this is a, I believe it's a 146-inch screen, which you can't tell it from the picture, but if you saw it in person, uh, if, if you can see my cursor here, this entire wall is actually a screen. What you're seeing here that looks like a TV is just the portion of the screen that they've chosen to look like uh, a TV. So it's it's very surreal when you walk up to it in person because you think that what is outlined in black here is a um, is an individual screen wh where it's actually just a a part of a much larger screen. All of this uh, lettering and uh, both above and below all the the simulated lighting here that's all actually on a screen, not on um, on a um, a physical wall. So uh, all kinds of crazy stuff going on in the in the the realm of of TV as well. Still very much a big part of, of CES, um, but I uh, won't dive too much deeper into any of that. We could talk for a long time about each one of these categories in, individually. But I also have to um, give a shout out to Valen Cell's customers who launched new products at CES, one of which was Skosh, who launched the, um, uh, the next generation of their Rhythm product, which is a, 
a uh, heart rate monitoring device that, that's uh, built for the arm, uh, either the forearm or the upper arm, and has a bunch of new advanced features and capabilities, including uh, measuring not only heart rate, but also heart rate variability. It's got onboard storage and significant battery life. I believe they're at least 24 hours of battery life, hence the name Rhythm24. Uh, and then our friends at Sunto launched uh, another new product, this one called the 3 Fitness. And it's a smart fitness watch uh, that uh, brings something new to the table that, that most of these uh, sports and fitness watches don't, which is this, uh, what they're calling adaptive training guidance, uh, which I've wondered why more companies haven't done this yet, but uh, Sunto is one of the first to do this, which is, um, as you uh, as you follow a training plan or a workout plan, using your activity levels and your your biometrics to understand how your body is actually responding to that workout plan, it will dynamically adjust that training plan as you go along and as the the system sees how um, how hard you're working in uh, in the previous workouts and adjust them accordingly. If it sees that you're your body's working too hard and it's, you're starting to get drained, then it will adjust the, the training down and then vice versa. If, if your body's responding very well to the, the training, then it might make the next few workouts a little harder. So, um, so some, some cool things there in terms of the uh, sports and fitness use cases from Sunto as well. And then, of course, Valencell made several uh, announcements. I won't dive into these too deeply, but uh, you can see and I've, I've added links to the, the press releases and more information on both of these. We announced um, the next generation of our benchmark biometric sensor system that, um, that focuses on maintaining the highest levels of accuracy while, uh, while drawing significantly less amounts of power um, to extend battery life and enable new capabilities in the devices that our technology gets embedded into. And then a variety of different software innovations that uh, focus on enabling new and different use cases similar to the, the, um, the Sunto device I talked about before, but also more advanced metrics and um, the ability to measure things like heart rate variability in, um, in light motion as opposed to today where it needs to be most heart rate variability metrics need to be measured completely at rest without any movement whatsoever. So uh, just a few um, uh, of the announcements there and uh, check those out if you're interested in more detail or uh, just shoot me a note. I'm, I'm happy to, to give you more information about any of those. And uh, with that, that's all I've got from a, a, a prepared content standpoint. If you do have any other questions, I'm looking now, I don't see any other questions that have come through, but uh, please do submit those through the uh, through the webinar interface now, and I'd be happy to take those. Or if you have, um, uh, if you think of other questions after we're done here, that's how to get a hold of me. And uh, please do reach out. I um, I would be happy to discuss this or uh, any other relevant topics um, uh, for anyone who's interested. Um, I did get a question um, from someone asking about, will the slides be available? Yes, we will make the slides available, and also this is being recorded, so we will, um, we will uh, send out a link to the recording as well. Uh, another question here it, it come, that has come through, in addition to the optical heart rate, do you see any other kinds of technology aiding health? Um, yes, absolutely. So um, the... Uh, some of the some of the more interesting things that we're seeing here is um, well, I guess the best way to describe it is with um, uh, sensor fusion. So um, taking in uh, sensor data, a variety of different types of sensor data uh, in one device, or, or uh, depending on the use case, use case, could be in multiple different devices that um, take in data from things like not just an optical heart rate monitor or biometric sensor system, but also from an accelerometer and a gyroscope and even potentially uh, an ECG or an EKG to identify uh, different patterns of body response to different activities that, uh, that a body is going through. So um, we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of interest along those lines in 
um, uh, pulling in data and aggregating data from a variety of different um, sensor systems to be able to triangulate on um, on uh, identifying different um, uh, exacerbations of disease states or identifying um, and, and doing um, uh, um, diagnostics around different disease states as well. Um, uh, one of the examples I mentioned earlier, I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that, is uh, identifying um, uh, migraines or predicting migraines in advance of, of uh, the migraine actually occurring. That's a good example of that requires a lot more than just the biometric sensor data that requires things like uh, barometric pressure and ideally uh, body temperature and activity levels and sleep cycles and those kinds of things that, so you're seeing a variety of different um, use cases like that emerge where um, you using this sensor data across a variety of different mechanisms to, to then be able to um, uh, identify uh, the onset of certain conditions or the exacerbation of certain conditions. Uh, looks like we've got a few more questions that have come in. Um, the benchmark announcement, is that addition, in addition to BE and BW 2.0? Yes, that, that is. Uh, we announced the benchmark, both BE and BW 4.0, and that, that's the, the um, announcement I mentioned before. Those are, um, those are scheduled to be, the, the new ones, the, the, the benchmark 4.0, is expected to be in sampling, I believe, at the beginning of Q2 and in production by the, the middle of this year. I believe that's the correct timing at the moment. Um, and happy to provide more detail if, if you're interested in, in more. Just um, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to uh, give you more detail there. Um, Let's see, next question. I saw on one slide that there are new products to be expected for blood pressure measured using a smartphone and multi-wavelength uh, uh, sensing. What's the status of these products at Valence Health? Uh, those are uh, in active development. All right, well, so let me take those separately. The blood pressure technology is in active development right now, and we're working with some early partners to, um, uh, to uh, complete that that um, uh, development work and, all, and more specifically, what devices that, that technology will end up going into. Smartphones are a very likely path, not the only path certainly, but um, a very likely one. And that's likely to be um, available this year. And, and by blood pressure, I mean completely cuffless and uh, we'll have both calibrated and uncalibrated models where um, uh, someone puts their finger over a sensor, and I should clarify, we, in terms of form factor, we have it working now um, within the ISO standard uh, for blood pressure measuring um, uh, and the, the calibrated model within, uh, within the ISO standard of within eight millimeters of mercury, um, both at the finger and also at the ear in an earbud. So um, you asked also about multi-wavelength sensing. That is available today. We have a, um, a development kit that uh, uses multi-wavelength sensing, and we have an implementation of that um, uh, that we demonstrated at CES that showed multi-wavelength sensing used in the blood oxygen, used to measure blood oxygen, as an example, specifically to measure SpO2, um, that, uh, and that specifically in an earbud, uh, measuring something like uh, blood oxygen at the wrist or other places on the body is extremely difficult to do optically, and you end up measuring things other than blood oxygen. Uh, there's there's a lot of misnomers out there around multi-wavelength sensing, and so you got to be careful of what you're actually measuring. <clears throat> uh, but that is available today. If you're interested, again, um, and more information on that, shoot me an email, and I'll, I'm happy to um, I'm happy to provide more information there. Um, and then uh, next question. Oh, wow, we got a lot of questions come in. Thanks, uh, thanks for all these. Uh, the next question, is there a heart rate monitor and accelerometer activity combined sensor from valence cell? What type of activity is, is detected? I think that's what the question was intending to ask. 
Um, yeah, so our, our standard benchmark modules include uh, the heart rate monitor and other, other biometric sensing, and, and there's an accelerometer incorporated in every, uh, every benchmark sensor module. So we, that, that accelerometer, you can either access the raw accelerometer data to use for whatever your use case might be, um, uh, but we also do activity recognition for things like uh, walking, running, sprinting, uh, and I believe we also do cycling. Uh, if we don't do it today, it's very near on the roadmap, so I, I'd have to look at that closer. If you're interested in a specific activity, either among that group or one I didn't mention, send me an email and I'd be happy to um, get you more detail there. Um, Let's see, uh, there's another question on blood pressure. I've seen it demoed by, uh, by valence cell, but, but do you have a rough timeline for when, if blood pressure management will be available as a feature on benchmark? I do not have a timeline on that at the moment. Um, we are, as I mentioned, it's still, still a technology under development and it's still, we're still working through what the, the actual implementation of that technology will look like, at least in the initial stages, if that's going to be in a benchmark sensor module or in um, in another form factor, we uh, we still don't um, still working through those details, but we should have those details uh, this year certainly, um, and we will um, uh, we'll provide more details as those become available. Okay, um, I am just going through the uh, questions here. Um, yeah, the uh, oh, one other question that has come in uh, on uh, the benchmark activity detection is uh, it detects the body position placed on the chest. I think is what uh, what that question is intended to say. Um, the, the activity detection is identified either at the wrist or arm or at the ear. That's uh, where, the, uh, where the algorithms have been tested. Uh, if there's a specific device or form factor that you'd be interested in testing those algorithms on the activity recognition algorithms on, we can certainly... Um, oh, uh, sorry, there's a clarifying here. The body position meaning uh, vertical, horizontal, uh, incline. Uh, as of this point, we don't have, uh, we don't offer that as a specific output, but that's something you could certainly identify with the, the raw accelerometer data. And um, if you didn't have that, the ability to do that yourself, we've, uh, we've probably got some partners who could take that raw accelerometer data for you and, um, and identify what you're looking for. We need to, to know, um, what you what exactly you're trying to do with that data, and then we could either help you directly or point you in the right direction. I believe that's it on the questions. Um, I, I did have a few uh, with interested in more details on the the um, the development of the technology and um, and the the history of the technology. I would suggest just reach out to me uh, via email and I'd be happy to, to talk through that in more detail. I'd be um, respectful of everyone's time here. I'm showing the, the top of the hour and uh, I'd just like to say thanks again for everyone uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us here today and uh, hopefully this was valuable and uh, please do join us for the, the next webinar in, uh, in February. Thanks again. Have a great day, everyone.